It's the ego, make it like that. Make you attached to this and that, make you feel proud of this and that, which is absolutely nothing. It's dust compared to the real thing, compared to your real purpose in life to meditate, okay? Like if your husband spoils you or love you so much and you become kind of a spoiled brat and uh, in going outside, you also became like that, demanding yeah, and proud, arrogant, or your wife is uh, spoiling you, uh, then you also became stubborn, yeah, too much ego, thinking, oh, yeah, I'm wonderful, I'm the best, I'm somebody. This is okay for self-confidence, but not overstep the boundary between self-confidence and arrogance. Then you'll be fine. You have to know, check yourself, whether or not you are obstructing yourself. This is really, really, really detrimental for your spiritual progress. You go nowhere, carrying around the ego like a baby, like a precious thing. Just let it go, okay? We are nobody. We are nothing, really. I mean, maybe outwardly, look like I'm your master and teaching you, but inwardly, I don't feel like I'm anything. Inside my feeling, I don't feel like I'm something important. I never had this kind of even feeling to grasp at, you know? I do my stuff, you know, diligently every minute, every second, every hour of the day, what I can. Take care of my dogs, take care of my things, do my business, take care of whatever I have to. And if you come, I teach you a few things, but in Wally, for example, suppose I do score you. It doesn't mean I'm arrogant or anything, because I don't feel like I'm anything. <laughs> I just do what I have to do. It's just like I tell my dog, stop it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> don't play too rough. Huh? That doesn't mean I don't love my dog. That doesn't prove that I'm because I'm their master. It's not like that. I just have to stop them before they get too serious. That's all. It's not because I'm their uh, owner. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm owner of the dogs or anything. I just have to take care of them. It's just a situation. Make it like that. It's just like if I teach you or I tell you something, it's just necessity, not because I think I'm a master, not because I think I have the right to do that. It's just automatic. It's, it's, it's spontaneous. So love doesn't always mean smooth talk or nice treatment. So get it quite clear. But don't pray that I scold you either. If all of you here come and ask me to beat you up, scold you, then what else would I do? Then we can forget the whole Sura Gamma Sutra or any Sutra or whatever. Yeah, just beat him, scold him, beat him, scold him, beat him, scold him. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of disciples, huh? Scold him, beat him all day long. Like Marfa, Milarepa's master. Like what? Like how Milarepa's master was beating his. Yeah, his disciple, he's only one disciple. There's thousands. Look around you, look around you. Yeah. And they haven't not all come here yet. Not all of them are here yet. Thank God that the, the world offer them jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not all can take holidays, yeah? And thanks God that some woman and some men do marry them. <laughs> Get rid of us, Master, yeah. but you can at least get rid of some. Yeah, get rid of some. Yeah. <laughs> through jobs, and through marriage. So children, thank God they also have children. <laughs> and friends, you know, and parents, yeah. Yeah. And mortgage, yeah. <laughs> and car, car to pay, you know. Television, machine, all these are keeping them somehow. Yeah, otherwise, how do I manage? <laughs> now we go back to the Buddha's business. Another man come called Gavampati, okay? And he has a problem with the mouth. It looked like a cow cut, you know, cow mouth. <laughs> so the first come one taught him my Graudama door of the purity of a single flavor. And then he became enlightened. Yeah, and he has no outflow, worldly outflows anymore. He transcended. Yeah. Internally, he was free of body and mind, and externally, I abandoned the world. I left the three existences far behind, just like a bird released from its cage. You know what the three existences? 
Thưa sư phụ, ý nói là vừa khỏi tam giới. Ừ. Mm. Yeah, good. So he had transcended the three worlds, liberated. Okay? Yes. The three worlds is always destructible, um, perishable. Above the three worlds is a more permanent, okay? Not destroyable. Mm. From the fourth level already. Yeah. So he feel like he's away from everything that is worldly, filthy, and not pure. Yes. And he became a heart. The third come one certified me in person as having ascended to the path beyond learning. The Buddha asked about perfect penetration as I have been certified to it. Returning flavor and turning awareness around is the superior method. What returning the flavor? And turning awareness around. Turning awareness around. The same like what you do every day. Instead of looking outward, you turn your attention inward. Yeah, and look inside instead. So whatever flavor it is, you return it to the original of all flavors. The reason the flower, the roses, had the smell as it is, because it originates from somewhere else. The reason you can smell the roses Because your smelling faculty originate from somewhere else. So return into the source in, in one saying, very simple. Just turn inward. Yeah. Whatever. If you have either flavor or fragrance, doesn't matter. If once you turn your attention inward, then uh, you know, you're in samadhi, you're free. Flavor or not, smelling fragrance or not. That's what it is, you know? The secret is turning inside to the real world. Not the physical illusion world here that we have. Similar, then they all turn inward by one method or another. Mm. It's just that you wait and see why we have to practice Kwan Yin method, okay? The punchline is still coming, yeah? Wait at the end. Mm. Now, there's another monk coming now, a monk named Pili Davasa, arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, When I first left home to follow the Buddha and enter the way, I often heard the thirst come one explain that there is nothing in this world that brings happiness. Is that true or not? Even if it brings a little temporary happiness, we pay a lot suffering afterward. No? Like romance, for example, beginning wars, how nice and hot and yeah, and uh, whatever. Yeah, and then uh, after a while, It's bitter taste and suffering, crying a lot, blah, blah. It's very difficult. Once you enter this kind of very narrow love relationship, and you just be kind of locked up in there, and you certainly you become jealous of anybody. <laughs> Any woman go near your boyfriend, you, you feel like a potential <laughs> threat. Any man go near, you feel like it's a potential danger to your relationship and your love, you know, for example. And then if the husband or the wife or the boyfriend or girlfriend that day somehow did something, this is not to your liking, you say, ah, I knew it. That must be that woman. Uh, oh, I knew it. That must be that man, you know. It's like that. And it becomes more and more narrow and more bickering, more sorrow, more possessive, instead of happiness. It's just the nature of things that turn out that way. Very difficult to control. It's your sixth sense <laughs> of, you know, outward uh, focusing. And then it brings in trouble. And the mind interprets it in a wrong way. And the heart beats it in a different way. It is the world that makes everything seem negative. And even though you normally have a very a good and, and happy relationship, things will happen to make you doubt it. I don't think any woman would never doubt her husband or boyfriend's love until the day she go into this uh, one meter square box, right? I heard all the time that they have doubt, they have suspicion about their love relationship, even though outwardly it seems so perfect. A couple, yeah, it seems like they're perfect. But there's never, 
always <laughs> spotlessly no suspicion. Yeah. And then because of suspicion, it breeds another suspicion. And then, then you watch your partner instead of loving him or her. You're watching him, you analyze it, you observe it. Oh, this is with negative thinking and expectation. And boom, it might come as you expect it. And then you say, ah, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it would happen. And now it comes. You see, I told you, I told you, I knew it. And then the more you told him or her, the more it happened. And nobody likes to stay in a bickering relationship. And then they have excuse to go. And then they start another, you start another, and another <laughs> war begins in different positions, different places, with different rival. Tell you. That's why the Buddha left home. He had 500 women. He should know. <laughs> 500 concubines. He should know. <laughs> That's why all these monks listened to him, because they trusted him. If the Buddha who has 500 wives doesn't know who else would know. <laughs> so you better trust him and be a monk. Be single, yeah? No wife, no woman. Huh? Trust him, be monk like him. Yeah, so that's why 2,000 monks always surrounding him, not wanting anything else, not wanting woman or anything. Even Ananda was already captured by a most beautiful woman and experienced Artisan, you know, of that time, most beautiful, and have even the Brahma mantra, the most powerful charm mantra of all time. He was already captured and trapped in there. Even then, he prayed for Buddha, please help me. <laughs> I just want to be a monk. Believe that? Because they trusted the Buddha. The Buddha is full of experience, not just in heaven, but on earth as well. So all the monks never waver, huh? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's why they all became monks, even though being a monk is not easy. You can't even look at any woman. You, when you walk, you just look about one, two meter in front of you only, huh? and then you don't even think about it. But later they, they did that naturally. They don't think anymore in that direction because they trusted the Buddha. Yeah? Then they all became very pure monks. That's why they became a heart or a bodhisattva so fast so quick, in a shorter time, because they trust the Buddha completely. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have 500 husbands <laughs> before I became a master. Then all of you probably became monk or nun already. Then I don't have to take care too much. All of you, I just give you each one one bow as a souvenir, <laughs> then you go outside. <laughs> take care of yourself. <laughs> and maybe bring some back to me. And now I have to take care, tell the kitchen, do what? Build a kitchen for you, build a place for you to eat, and worry about the rain that might uh, fall into your cup and become a soup instead. Oh. <laughs> Even staying in the cave far away from you, have to worry about your food, whether or not they cook good. And because you're all different nationalities. And the Korean would probably miss the kimchi. And <laughs> and <laughs> The Westerner miss their cheese and, you know, cereals, breakfast. Here we only have congee soup, all the same for everybody. Korea or uh, Indian or German or English or America, no care. <laughs> eat or not. <laughs> only one choice, eat <laughs> or not eat. <laughs> Never mind, you won't die for a few days, will you? No, huh? You, you manage, right? You can bear the suffering, right? <laughs> I feel sorry for you. Wow, what a suffer you have to go through. <laughs> Eating congee instead of cereal's breakfast. Nah? Mm. But you seem so happy, so it must be suiting everybody, you know? Just like we all practice one method, <laughs> we all eat the same food. Don't worry, I eat the same with you, okay? I eat the same thing. Not, nothing extra, okay? I made them give me the same food so that I know whether or not they cook at least decent, okay? Swallowable. <laughs> it's delicious. Oh, you are just too hungry, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> at home, you have a chance to go to your own kitchen. No? It's all right. You eat when you feel like. There are always some leftover in the kitchen. It depends on the cook. Miracles always happen.
some chef come and he cook the congee a little dense, and some other come is like watery. I experience the ebb and flow of, <laughs> of my life and the kitchen style, you know, all the time. Some cook very generously, a lot and good flavor. Some are just simple, very uh, sparingly, yeah, as if want to save money. Yeah, one day I had to kind of admonish them. I said, the, the workers, they stay here, you know, or they came here to work, to repair all the area construction. They work from morning till night and very hard, you know, and also the weather is cold. And they are Chinese or Vietnamese, mostly Asian. And the way you cook congee like this, they don't have enough physical, you know, stamina, strength to continue in the cold and rain. You stay in the kitchen. You can eat any time you want or anything. If you don't like it, you can always cook something for yourself. And you stay in a warm place inside the building. They have to work outside. You have to cook the congee better than this, thicker, okay? Because the Chinese or Vietnamese, they like congee, you know, the rice soup. You have to make it more substantial. That's the only time <laughs> I demand the difference. The rest, I normally eat whatever they eat. I don't really care so much. But sometimes I advise them, because sometimes the protein don't taste so good, then the, the salad is just too plain. You put some more nuts in it, or the sauce has to be not too sweet. No, put some avocado in the salad so people have also more protein and essential quality, a substance. Yeah, that's all I do. Mm? Okay. <laughs> 